بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We begin in the name of Allah and send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So this uh, session was I was asked to put together a program for planning for Ramadan, and I like the title "Planning for Ramadan" rather than it be a lecture where I talk about the benefits of Ramadan. Because I, I firmly believe that if, if we went around the room and I asked everybody, what is a great Ramadan? What should we be doing in Ramadan? I know that everybody in here knows all of the things. We could just go, we could even do a, a quick round and people say, well, this and this and this. So I, this workshop is going to be working on the assumption, and it's not even an assumption, it's a firm belief that everybody in here and those watching or watching the record, recording knows what are the great things that we can do in Ramadan, how we can optimize the benefit of us deriving blessings from Ramadan. So with that, we're just going to go straight into planning, and I want to share some of the things that, that, that I've collected over the years from my uh, work in looking at planning and action planning and specifically because of the work that we do in Taiba Foundation where we work with people who are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated and the families and people who are affected by incarceration either they're at risk for incarceration or they have family members who are incarcerated. And so a big, not even a big, a critical component of a person gaining their own freedom from prison and getting out of prison and also preventing themselves from going back to prison, which is called a recidivism rate, is planning and action planning. And these plans are so critical that when they go up for a board of parole hearing, I mean, and it would be as intimidating as this. Imagine you're sitting kind of where you are right now, looking at me, and there's two or three other people, commissioners, many people who are former attorneys, and they're looking at your plan and they're making the determination almost like Caesar, you know how like Caesar would do the thumbs up, thumbs down. They're making the de determination, are you suitable for release? And you could have been in prison for 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years. And it all comes down to people looking at your plan and then saying, are you suitable for release? So that's how critical it is. And so for that reason, we've given a lot of time, thought, consideration, development of planning within Taiba. One of the things that we've brought into the Taiba Foundation in the, 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 the planning is a specific course that we offer to our students in prison. And just recently, about a month ago, well, I'll start the story six months ago, there was a, a university where some of the law students, one of their projects, and, and listen to this, this is how impactful some of these projects that the professors bring into the classroom can be. The professor said, we're going to give you a case where a person is working for their freedom. They're about to go up for parole, but they're just doing it on their own. And so imagine somebody with no law background is going to be facing a panel of, 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 of attorneys and, um, and, and people who are commissioners within the state, and they're making the determination for their freedom. And so they, gi they give the law students these projects and say, now work with this student, help them develop their plan that they're going to present to, uh, to the board of um, uh, the board of parole hearings. So she reached out to us at Taiba because this person was a student and we, we sent a lot of information and she said, is there anything I can do, like another course that this student can do in preparation for that? Because he still had a few more. I said, have him take our planning course because that planning course will, will allow him to put everything together in a plan that's actually industry standard, so to speak. It's recognized. And a lot of the ideas that he might have had here and there, kind of an ad hoc development of a plan, it's going to give him a formal template. And then he can, he can use the words from the language of planning, of action planning, and be able to articulate that to the Board of, uh, of Commissioners. So he took the, he took the course. He put his plan together, and he had been in prison over 20 years. <clears throat> and then at, the, at the, the parole hearing, she said they actually determined that he was eligible for his freedom. And she said his planning, the, the planning course that he had taken with Taiba, was a, a, a critical component in him gaining his freedom. So that's how, that's how powerful and impactful uh, planning can be. And we've developed some other planning programs as well. So I, I put this short packet together, the one that you have in your hands. Those who are watching online, you could just use a piece of paper as we go through things. Um, and 
and as you write th things out, uh, you'll see that I've taken some, I've gleaned some things from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the the tradition of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and some some things from from what we learned in modern research about planning and about change and habit change and so forth. So the first thing you'll see on the top of that page is, you see that drawing right there? I, I printed this out from another uh, seminar that we, that we offer as well, which is called the prophetic model of teaching, and we use that as our cover picture. How many of you have seen that image before? Right there on the top, first page. You've seen it? One person. Okay, for the rest of you who haven't, if you've seen it and you know what it is, don't answer. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was with his companions. And he drew, don't, actually don't read the hadith first. If you've already read it, that's going to be skipping ahead. I just want you to look at the image. Alright? So the Prophet وسلم, was with his companions. He drew a square in the sand. He drew a line from within the square emanating out of the square. And then he drew some lines on the side of it. Now, we don't know exactly what it looks like, but this is my interpretation based on that description. And in some of the books of Hadith narration, they'll actually draw in the book of Hadith what they interpret it as well. So I've looked at what some of the Hadith scholars have written it as, my interpretation, and that's how I've made it. Okay, he said that this is, this is, um, The square around him, okay, the line going through, let's just, uh, that's what I'm going to start. Don't read the hadith. But the line going from in the box, outside of the box, is you. That's a human being. And the line and the square, that's life. That's where your life, you know, the, the, the limits of your life. What do you think the lines going out are? Just as a guess. What's it? Hardships. That's exactly what it is. So let's go ahead and read the, read the hadith. This is the human being, and this is the square, his inevitable death, encircling him from all sides. And this line, which is outside the square, is his hope. And these small lines are the calamities and troubles which may befall him. And if one misses him, another will befall him, overtake him. And if that misses him, a third will befall him, overtake him. There's always something coming up in life, right? So why is the line going outside of the box, though? After life, it could be after life. His hope, if the line represents his hope, why is it going outside of the box? Yusuf? Their trials are tests are in there. Okay, so now I'm getting some, some more insight. That, that's the beautiful thing about the hadith. There's no one specific answer. So I didn't even think about, oh, maybe it's the after, there's some element of the afterlife there. So that, thank you, sister, that gave me a new insight. And then you're telling me about, you know, there's no more hardships after death. Anything else? Just that his hope is so strong. His hope is so strong? That it, that it goes beyond his limits. Beautiful. I didn't think about that as either. Because if we, if we work towards something, even if we aim for the sky, we know we're going to fall below that. But aiming high is going to make whatever we reach that much more powerful, right? So that, those are three insights that I didn't even think about before. And we can keep looking for these. We can keep un uncovering insights. That's why I'm presenting it to you because don't stop at what other people have told you. Keep looking and keep digging. So now I've taken this idea and I said, okay, let's use this as a, as a planning model. Let's use this as a planning model. But before going through the rest of it, I want you to take a moment, and now on the second page... It says, if you could have the optimum Ramadan experience, what would it look like? And Yusuf, if there's one over there, I'm going to do this as well, too. Because one of the things about planning is that it never stops. You can always, you always need to revisit your plans. Add to, and can, could you grab me a pen? A pen? So now we're going to take about five minutes, and people who are watching at home or watching this video, just get a piece of paper or... If you're on your phone, you could also do it on the phone or the computer, but there's, there's something that's, there's a, there's a secret with writing things in hands. We don't know exactly what it is. One of the companions came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, I'm struggling with memorizing your sayings, with memorizing your hadith. What can I do? He said, seek, seek help from your right. And he made the sign of writing with his hand.
your yamin, seek assistance from your yamin, your right, your, 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 your hand, and he made the sign for, for writing. So there's something about it. So now this, if you could have the optimum Ramadan experience, and this is called the magic wand um, exercise. We wave a magic wand. We know Muslims don't practice magic. Uh, but we wave a magic wand, and everything that you want to happen can happen. So this Ramadan coming up in about 10 days, everything, like if you could have the optimum, like no, there's, there's no holds, nothing holding you back. What does that look like? So we're just going to take about five minutes to, to just make a list, write it out, whatever it'll be. All right, for those who have finished, you can keep writing if you're still writing, but for those who have finished, how does it feel, if you don't mind sharing, like just how did that process feel? It's like one or two words that describe like how that felt. Oh, released anxiety? Yeah. Okay, how many, how many others felt like that, like it released some anxiety? Yeah. Was it fun? Just to be able to like have it the way you want it to be? Yeah. Did it feel a little bit freeing? Like you said, release anxiety. So that's kind of like the friend, like I could just, no holds barred, like, or nothing's holding you back. You can have it as you want. So, so in that, this is where we're going to, we're going to, we're going to start with this. Like you want to, you want to plan it out how you see it, the, 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 the magic wand experiment. If, if it could be the way I wanted it, if everything could be the way I wanted it. And so a couple of things are happening there. One, instead of somebody telling you how your Ramadan should be, you know what you want in your Ramadan. And your ibadah is a personal experience. Your worship is a personal relationship with your Lord. And so it should reflect that. You're not just saying, oh, I'm going to go get a pre-templated Ramadan journal, which they do have them and they're great. But for any of you who have done planning, you know, you pick up any journal. Have you found that one planning system that works, that's like perfectly templated and you don't have to change anything? Has anybody found that yet? No, right? You haven't found Nobody's found that. I haven't found it yet either. Because every time you look at it, you're like, oh, I wish it had a little bit like this over here or a little bit like this over there. So <clears throat> that's the thing about planning. It's very individual specific. And so you want your planning to reflect that. And you might have to make your own templates and your templates might change. And so that's one thing that it's a very individual experience. Nobody's telling you what to do. And then also you are the expert on yourself. You're the expert on yourself. And if you recognize that you're the expert on yourself, you know what you can do. You know what your capabilities are. You know what your limits are. And so you don't need somebody to tell you, this is how your Ramadan should look like. Because you know yourself better than anybody else. There's only one who knows you better than you. Who's that? Allah. Do the angels even know you? These invisible beings that are with us all the time recording, do they know you? Because what they don't have access to, and I see you're shaking your heads, no, that's absolutely right. They don't know. They, don't have, they only have access to, what do they write down? Your deeds. Most of what happens in your day are what? Inside, your thoughts. And that's where you're alone with Allah. They're not, they're not counting that. There's some scholarly discussion on whether or not that they write down what's called a azima. You know, before you do an action, you know, it starts in the heart where you, you get to the point where you say, all right, I'm going to do that. So it goes from just a thought, a khatira, of this thought that's being played around in your soul. You're, it's bouncing back and forth. You're, you're, you're ruminating over it. You're looking at it from all sides. And then it gets to a point where you're like, that's what I'm going to do. And so some scholars say that it, when it gets to that point, that, that that thought actually becomes an action, an action of the heart, and that's what they can write down. And other examples uh, are like, um, and, and one of the differences, uh, well, we could go into to that, but just think about jealousy, for example. Is jealousy an act of the limbs or of the heart? It's a heart, but where does it show up? On your limbs. And so if it's a disease of the heart, and it's something that the angels are going to record, and like the hadith says, that jealousy will eat up your good actions like what? Like a fire eats dry wood. Whenever you've burned something, you know, if you've been on a camping trip and you bring wet wood versus dry wood, you're looking for dry wood because that's going to... Uh, Turn, uh, burn really quickly, and so that's what the hadith says. That your, the, your, 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 um, your hasad, the jealousy, will burn up your good actions like 
the fire burns dry wood to give you an image of what it is. And so at what point does that jealousy get to the point where it's eating up your good actions and the angels are recording that because it's a disease of the heart. So some of the scholars said that it's when that jealousy becomes uh, appears on your limbs and now that the angels are recording it. And others are saying, no, it's actually when it gets to that point where that jealousy has overtaken the heart and there now they have a firm commitment in the heart. I'm going to do this or say this or, or, or something like that. So that's just a, a, a little side note about actions of the heart. But at the end of the day, you know yourself better than anybody else. And there's only one, and that's Allah, who knows you better than yourself. And he's closer to us than our jugular vein. And where does our jugular vein come from? Our heart. So that's what the ayah is saying. You, he's closer to you than your jugular vein because the, 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 the jugular vein is right next to your heart. He knows your heart because he's not physically, literally in there. We're not, we don't, we're not pantheists. We believe that Allah is in creation. Him being closer to you than, your, than the jugular vein means he knows your inner, innermost secrets and thoughts. And he knows things about yourself that you don't even know about yourself, that we have yet to uncover. And so going on that premise that we are the experts on ourselves, that's where this planning is very important. Now, um, nobody else can tell you how your Ramadan should, should, should look like. So another point too, some of the things that you may have written are very personal are very personal. And one thing I want to, uh, to, to, to mention is that the, what we're taught from the Prophet wasallam is that we're not to look into the secrets of other people. So we're not to, we're not to spy, we're not to uh, pry into matters, we're not, we're not supposed to even ask too many questions about a person. Somebody might say, oh, I'm not spying, I'm just, but you know there's people who can, they just, they just talk and then you walk away and you're like, man, why did I say that? Because they know, and maybe they don't even realize they're doing, they know how to ask the right questions and then they can, they can pull out from you, extract information from you that you didn't want to share. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't do that. Don't ask those too many prying questions. How are you doing? How are things? MashaAllah, you know, keep things light. Maybe with your personal friends, you know where you can, where they want to have that conversation go. So we're not to pry. And so from, from that Adab or that etiquette and that rules, that legislation of interaction, he said, don't look into the books of other people. Don't look in the books of other people. And in the hadith narrated by Abu Dawood, he said, whoever looks into the book of his fellow, into his, the hadith says brother, but we also know that means sister, so his fellow, whoever looks into the book of their fellow, he has looked into the fire, has looked into the fire. So if a person has a journal, they don't have to keep it locked. They don't have to keep it behind locked doors. Don't open up somebody's journal. And so this is a personal journal. Um, and somebody, oh, let me see what you write. Or if we ask, unless a person is okay with sharing it. And so that's where I'm now going to, to, um, um, uh, to ask if, if somebody is okay sharing. Is there something you wrote down here and that you're okay sharing with everybody else here in the world and the world, really, because the internet's over there. Um, if you're okay, that something that came out of here that you're planning for it, that you haven't planned for it before, but it was because of this, like the magic wand experiment that we did. Anybody have something they want to share? Yes. Complete fasts in a calm and peaceful manner. Mashallah. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. like, instead of waiting like for the time to go by fast, like savoring every moment. Wow. Okay. So so uh, you said that um, that you usually count the hours like the countdown till until the fast is over, but your your goal is to just savor every moment and not do that. Mashallah. Yeah. Anyone else? I put one, which is um, one thing that I would like to do is uh, reach out to family more often. You know, even though it's not necessary, like a, well, it is a form of ibadah, but it's not some that one that we typically think of in Ramadan. But silatul rahim, connecting with family, is a big part of the, the the deen. And so, if I put that, if I make that intention that that's my my um, part of my worship, especially in that month, and I'm now going to do it on a regular basis. So that's one of mine. And so you see, everybody's got something very unique and very uh, specific. And that's the beautiful thing about ibadah. You ready to share? Wa alaikum salam. 
Sorry for joining later. No, nope. the mode. Well. Yeah. Mm. So try to get at least two, three minutes without any difficulty. Okay, so to try to have two or three minutes in the story that uh, that he was sharing was that somebody came to the sheikh and he was asked, there was three people, he asked them, how long did you fast? And my, my, my assumption is that, that they were fasting. This is Ramadan. Right. Yeah. So they were fasting and so the first person said, I fasted till 10 a.m. And then the second person said, I fasted till Dhuhr. And then he hugged them. The Dhuhr guy or the other one? The Dhuhr. 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 He hugged the Dhuhr person. So the third person says, Wait a minute, this is, why are you hugging him for just fasting till Dhuhr? This is Ramadan, it's, you know, till, until Maghrib time. And he said, no, he was actually fasting from all of the other things. That's how he got, you know, because we know we leave food and water, that's the easy part. But those other things, like the calmness, the anger, the, the and like you said, not being outside of the dhikr of Allah, just being in that presence. And so that's where they were, they were, they, they were guiding. So just, you said your goal would be to have just a few minutes of that. Yeah. 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 And that's a, that's a great, mashallah, that's a great goal as well. And so this is the other thing too that we're doing in this, that we're taking the fast to another level. That it's not just leaving the food and water. We're saying, what else can we do? The fast is a platform that allows us uh, to do other things and makes it, ma makes it that much easier. The other thing to consider is that as we're looking at this, one of the goals that we have in Ramadan is that each Ramadan should be better than the previous one. So not just like, okay, because you get to a point in your life where the food and water, that's the easy, right? Who, who, and I know some people struggle with it, so I don't want to detract from that. Some people really struggle with the food and water. But then you get to a point where you're, you're seasoned. Even like little kids sometimes, they get to the point, you know, they, if they've been fasting since they were six and seven, it gets to a point where it's like, all right, I just skipped breakfast and lunch and had a late dinner, right? Especially now as it mo it's moving into the winter time. So you get seasoned, so it's like, okay, is that where you're going to stop? If, you're, oh, if, you, if you can shoot uh, a two-pointer every single time, are you going to stop right there or are you going to go for half court, a, th a three-pointer? And then once you get that and you're like, every single time I get a three-pointer, and then you're going to go to half court, and then maybe from the other end of the side, and then you start doing trick shots, open up a YouTube channel, and then... Um, um, so we want to make every Ramadan better than the previous one. The other thing, the other benefit of personalizing your Ramadan is that when we get into a routine, we can actually start worshipping the ibadah. We can actually worship the worship. Think about that for a moment. We can actually start worshipping the worshipping. And um, Ibn Ata'illah in his famous book Al-Hikam, the, 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 the Wisdoms, he says one of, the, one of the signs that we do things for other than the sake of Allah, listen to this, the sign that we're doing an action for other than the sake of Allah is that when we slip on that action, we miss it or we do something we shouldn't have, that we fall into the state of deep despair. We fall into a state of deep despair. Why? He says because you were, you were depending on your action and not depending on Allah. You were depending on your action and not depending on Allah. And so we want to, we, we don't want to give up the actions. We know there's a, that we have to fulfill the outward. But we're not doing the action for the action. And it's so important that we have to, we have to get that action. Because we know we're depending on the rahmah of Allah. And I'll give you an a, example of, of where you can look for a, a cue that you might not be doing it for the right reason. So if a person, say for example, their goal is to pray their tarawih every single rakah in the masjid, but they have a family. And you know how hard that is, right? Because somebody's got to sacrifice so that uh, somebody else can go to the family. If, if you have a family uh, uh, and there's a number of people in the house, can everybody get to the masjid and get all 20 rakahs and get back home? Is there any families out there, the super families? If they are, I'd like to eat what they're eating for suhoor. Um, but so you know, so if, if now if a person is, is going to trample on other people so that they can hit their goals, trample on other people so that they can hit their goals, fall, fall short of fulfilling the rights of other people so that they can hit their goals, they're not doing it for the sake of Allah. We have to ba balance things out. Okay, now let's go to the next page. Looking at your list, you got your list. Now that's 
what you want for the entirety of Ramadan. And the beautiful, the, the, one of the many, many blessings of Ramadan is that it really gives us, it paces our days. The rest of the year, we're kind of like all over the place. Ramadan, you got to eat here, and this is when you don't eat, and this is when you break your fast. It really forces us to get into a pace. This is when, you, when you're going to get up. This is when you're going to sleep. You know, you don't have to, but is, that, is it fair to say that it puts us in that pacing? It really it forces us to pace ourselves and then as a community. So now that was your that was your entire month that you're looking at, and you're gonna break it up over Ramadan. So now you're gonna look at your page and break those up into what's gonna take you one to two hours? What's gonna take you half an hour to 45 minutes daily? This is daily. Um, what's gonna take you 10 to 15 minutes, and what's gonna take you three to five minutes? And so just kind of break it up by that. Did everybody hear that? I'll repeat it for those watching. So it made it seem easy because you realize that everything is, is in that uh, three to five minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and, um, um, and it, it's so easy, but we just make all these excuses, and we really can get through this. And when you were, as you were speaking, I was feeling you were, you were speaking my exact same thoughts as well. Because I haven't done this before. Like, we're going through this all the same together. I put this together, but I haven't personally gone through this, this, this packet. And then as I'm writing things out, I was like, huh, everything's in the 10 to 15, three to, in fact, most of it's the three to five minutes. But what happens at the end of my Ramadan? I'm like, I start getting frustra frustrated and resentful and beating myself up and like all of this, like I didn't get to everything that I want to get to. Well, what's wrong, Rami? What's preventing you from getting you? Well, there, there's so many things I'm so busy, but then now this is showing me, no, it's actually, it's not that, right? Anybody else have that feeling? And then there's some things, like if it's things in the heart, that's not even a three to five minute thing. That's just like a, a reframing that you're doing in your heart. Like that's just a few seconds or maybe a minute to if you're, if you're really going to reflect on it. Anybody else has some reflections they might want to share? That's what I had a hard time with. It's like, where do I put those things? That it's really, it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing, right? Yeah, so I have to, maybe I have to add that. So we have to add. So I, I could put a good chunk of mine because... <laughs> it's a, of the heart, right? Yeah, I actually, in the three to five minute, I kind of like circle those. So I'm going to, I can, that, that's a good way we can add this. Um, and this is, this is why you see the templates are just, it's kind of a guide, but it's not necessarily like, it's, a, it's an end all. And one of the things that they talk about in education is that there's two methods of education. One is sage on the stage. And I'm on the stage, so I'm not a sage. But if you have a lot of, like, if you think about lecture style, if somebody just lectures for two or three hours, that's sage on the stage. Whereas guide on the side is where you now, it's a student-centered model of education, and you're just helping the person along, and there's not necessarily this, like, one direction type of um, a flow of information. This is something where we're, we're working together. And after learning that concept, when I now look at how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be with his companions, just with those two, two, um, two statements, do you think he was the guide on the side or the sage on the stage? Both. both. Guide on the side, maybe both elements. There's sometimes where you are, it is the sage on the stage. If you're giving a khutbah, you got a captive audience, right? Nobody, it's haram to say anything, right? I, I, I personally feel that one of, the, one of the wisdoms of it being haram in the khutbah is that it forces people to listen. Because if, if I'm over here, this is not a khutbah interaction, but if you really, really don't agree with something, you'll say something and leave, right? But it, the khutbah for the presence, especially for the men, it being wajib to, to sit through the khutbah and to be quiet, it forces you to listen to the other side, which is a big component of dialogue. Like you really have to learn the skill of listening and just, you know, silently, even if you don't agree with it. Um, so, so you can make changes. So that's another change that we could make. We can say, okay, there's something that's even below three to five minutes. Anything else that's uh, kind of came through to you through this that you don't mind sharing? Yusuf. Oh, wow. So you realize everything uh, one to two hours or more. So what did that tell you? Uh, that I have a lot of time. You have a lot of time. Oh, okay. See, that's, I'm thinking about it from me. My <laughs> from me, my, if, I, if everything was up at one or two hours, I'd be like, okay, that's not reasonable. 
right? But for you, you have a lot of time, mashallah. And that's one of the benefits of being at your age. And one of the hadith is um, that, that one of the people who will have shade on the day that there is no shade for anybody except for the shade of Allah is a young person who grew up in the practice of, uh, in, the, in the worship of Allah. And it's a very, very spiritual stage. Some people think, oh, teenage years, you know, they're all over. No, this teenage years actually are a very spiritual time. That's going to determine things for the rest of your life. And so if you're using them in worship, mashallah. So now you just realize if most things are in one to two hours, though, you have to plan so that, um, um, that, that, that you can handle it. And then what it, what it showed for me when I did this, I said, okay, the things that I have there that are in the one to two hour or the 30 to 45 minutes, I really have to plan for those. And even for the other ones, the three to five minute ones, if you add those up, like I have about a good hour right there in the three to five minutes. And so now you have to say, okay, what's, now we go to the next page. And let's actually start with the, the reasonable limits uh, and constraints. Um, so, you know, on that drawing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made, there was a square, which is basically like, you have hopes that go beyond your um, your constraints, but there is a constraint. So now just, you know, what are some of the reasonable, reasonable limits and constraints? So now you're looking at hours beyond work, school, other obligations that you have. How many hours do you actually have? What are some, re what are some time constraints that you're, going to be, to, that you're going to be faced with? And then once you're done with those, we'll just take about five minutes to do either of these. You got your reasonable limits and the constraints. Also, what are some of the things, the distractors, stressors, personal habits, events that are going to come up that are going to take you away from being able to do what you're going to do? So just take a few moment, moments to, uh, to fill those two out. Anything jump out at you at the uh, distractors, stressors, habits, habits event, something that you didn't think about before? Or maybe you thought about it, but now seeing it on, down on paper, it makes you look at it a different way. One of my students... Um, my friends, I, he started as a student, now I, I, I look at him uh, first and foremost as a friend, Brother Ahmed Adisa, he's in prison, make dua, he gets out, he has a life without parole, and the two witnesses that put him in, he, his case is with the Innocence Project, the two witnesses that put him behind bars, even though he was on the other side of St. Louis when the murder he was uh, uh, convicted for was charged, he had alibis, he was on the other side of St. Louis, the two witnesses came back and they said they lied about their testimony. Uh, and still he's in prison without, without parole. So um, may Allah uh, give him his freedom. Uh, I was talking to him uh, and he was, um, um, I, look, I look to him for a lot of advice, especially when it comes to this kind of work, planning, coaching. And I look to him as a, as a coach in many things. And so we were talking about something. He said, journal about that, journal about that. And then he told me something very profound, which was there's something about when you put your thoughts down on paper, it removes the power from that like the power that they hold. As long as that thought was in your mind, once you put it down on paper, it's different. So now with that in mind, as you're looking at some of the things, what, what jumps out at you as, as some of the, the reasonable limits and constraints or the, the, the other thing that you don't mind sharing? Mm, the intrusive, so having intrusive thoughts, thinking about the past, thinking about the future, but not staying in the moment. Um, and that can take up time. Yeah, because that chews up a lot of our time. And one of the things, you know, the du'as the Prophet Sallallahu made was, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Min al-hammi wal-hazan. What are the differences between those two things? He said, hem are those thoughts, and they, the scholars say, one of the understandings is, it's the worries about the future. And the hazan, the sadness, are the, the worries or the sadness that we feel about things that have passed. So, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. And so, if you're seeking, if we're granted refuge from that, from worries of the, sadness over the past and worries over the future, it allows us to be in the moment. And there's many, many descriptions of what is spirituality in Islam. We know what theology is. We know what we have to believe. We know what practice is. That's very determined, right? This is how you pray. This is how you fast. This is how you make hajj. If you mess up on this, this is how you fix it. Isn't it very specific? There's no wiggle room on a lot of things. There's some that is, there's a difference of opinion, but the law is very clear. The theology is very, very clear. When it comes to spirituality, ihsan, what is it? How do you define the ihsan? In the hadith, it's that you worship Allah as if you see him, and that if you don't see him, that you know that he sees you. 
Furthering along that is that you, they say that you, uh, you are Ibn Waktika, that you're, you're, you're the, the, the child of your moment. You're in the, the presence in the moment. If you can maintain presence at every single moment, not worrying about the past or the future, or not sadness over the past and future, and you can be in the moment, that is that you've, atta you, you've attained spirituality. Anything else that you don't mind sharing? Mm, okay. So, so, this, uh, so the, the, that quote of um, uh, life is short, but eternity is forever, was was kind of like signifies what you this this path that you've been on especially with the umrah, uh, the umrah in ramadan which congratulations i know it was hot too but it was that it's overshadowed uh, overshadowed by the blessings that you experience in, in mecca and medina um and so that gave you a rejuvenated connection to your faith and you hope to have this ramadan be along that way rather than the previous of oh let's just you know i i can do things when i'm older let me just have fun right now yeah Masha'Allah. So that is, those are things that could come up, our, our, our old habits. I'm going to add that too. I'm going to put that in there, old habits. So we all have them. One thing that jumped out to me that was at the top of the, the distractor, stressor, or habits of uh, events is other people. Right? And we know in the hadith it's clear, like it says, if you're fasting and another person wants to fight, what do you say? I'm fasting. And it's not philosophical. The Prophet ﷺ, he knows people, he knows human beings and how they're going to interact. And then especially when they're under the, 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 the difficulties of fasting, right? There's this term hangry, right? You're going to, your inhibitions are down and you could actually lash out a little bit quicker, even though the blessings of the fasting are there, but then there's the physiological elements of, of reduced uh, food in your system. And, and, and so he's saying, say you're fasting. Um, the Quran knows uh, Allah, of course, he's, he knows us better than, than, than ourselves. On Hajj, we're told, okay, you do all these great things. One is, what is one of the other main things that you don't do at Hajj? Hmm? Don't get angry. Don't get into arguments. And you know when you get in big crowds of people, especially you of those of you who have been in Mecca and Medina, right? It will test your limits. Oh my goodness, it will test your limits. I was one time in, in, in Kaaba in Ramadan, and it was, subhanAllah, it was, the, it was a fast. Like, I was going to, I was just going to do a one-night Umrah. My father-in-law was still living in Saudi at the time, so I just took a, a, a quick flight, and then I didn't even have anything planned. I was just going to, like, it was just going to be one night, I'll find a place to sl sleep. And I wasn't planning on fasting, because it was in the summertime. And I was like, I'm going to be traveling. And so, but then I met these brothers on the, on the bus and they're like, hey, how are you going to get to Mecca? Because we're all wearing a haram. That's a beautiful thing about like believers getting your, oh, you, you know, it's clear. We're all going to, to Mecca. How are you getting there? I was like, I don't know. We're going to get a taxi. No, I'm renting a car. Let's go. The other person, like, how are you, where are you going to stay? I was like, I don't know. Oh, I'm going to rent a hotel. You stay with me. So then it, it worked out. But then they decided to fast. So I was like, okay, you know, group think, right? I was like, I'll, I'll fast too. But I hadn't planned that. So all I had was like a half bottle of water and a, and a banana that we just bought like 10 minutes before, before Fajr. And it was a hot day. And I did my Umrah during the daytime. Um, and, and subhanAllah, like by As when Asr time came along, um, I, was, I was looking at people like carrying bags of Zemzem and I could see the dew and the drops on the bags and I was just looking at it. I could see people in the Saha like doing Tawaf and they were like drinking Zemzem and pouring it all over their heads and I was like, that what it was, but I remember every moment of that day. Like that was my hardest fast that entire month. But I was like, even by the time like I got my uh, uh, iftar, it was on, in the little airport on the way back in Jeddah um, and I was looking at the bottle of water and you know sometimes they'll have like a leaf with like dew drops on it. And I was like, oh my goodness, like it's, it was really hard that day. Um, why do I mention that? Oh, because I was sitting there in that state, it was, hard, it was a hard fast, and then there's people who want to do wudu, and they're sitting around the Zemzem container, like I'm sitting there in the, and it's marble floor, right? And they, they got the Zemzem, they open up the Zemzem, and they're doing wudu with the Zemzem, and the water's just going everywhere. And then one person doesn't, then another person. Pretty soon there's four people sitting in front of me where I'm trying to pray, and they're doing wudu with the zemzem. And I was like, what are you guys? I, then I, I spoke up, I, and one of the person just looked at me, and he's just, you know, just keep, just keep going. I'm like, okay, I'm fasting. So you know it'll test your limits. One time I was on, it was, this was in Fremont, and um, I was wearing a kufi. And for some reason, I've had this happen a couple times. I'm wearing a kufi, I'm driving, somebody has road rage, and then they tell me, go back to Pakistan. <laughs> so I've gotten go back to Pakistan. I've gotten um, 
you, you, you bleeping rabbi. <laughs> For no reason. I didn't do anything. He didn't cut me off. I didn't go. We were just both stopped at the stoplight. And he, and he said, you know, you're rabbi. And, and um, I wasn't mad that he called me a rabbi. I was mad that he called me something. So, but anyway, so one time uh, I was in the car and I was fasting. And these two, like, high schoolers were crossing the street. They saw me. And then they called me, um, like, they use a profanity. And they said, you terrorist. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys are walking in the crosswalk. I'm in my car. You know how Muslims get down, right? I mean, you're... <laughs> No, we don't do that. Um, but, um, but if you have that racial understanding of what we're... You're calling me a terrorist and I got a car. What do you think I'm going to do? But I'm fasting and I remember that. And I was just like, okay, I got to tell him I'm fasting. So I just... I smiled and waved at him. And, and you know what he did? He smiled and waved back. But it was like awkward. He was like, he's like man, you, you beep, 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 terrorist. And I said... It was a few moments because there was other things that I could have said or done. And I had to check myself. And I said, the prophet told me to say I'm fasting. He's not going to get that. So I'm just going to wave. And it's going to be like, I smiled. I tried to make it a sincere smile. And then you just see like there, there was this like odd shaking. Like I'm sure in his brain, like all of the, 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 the wires are firing. They're like, do not know how to process this. He didn't know how to process it. And so his hand came up kind of awkward. He was like, hey. I was like, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, he knew people and how we should respond to people. So, other people, kids, school, work, um, kids' homework, iftar shopping prep. Um, I put down laziness because we all get lazy because we, we have our magic wand of what we want, but then, especially in the last days of Ramadan. Um, and so, the, then now, we, anybody else want to share something from reasonable limits, constraints, distractor habits? What's that? Physical tiredness. Physical tiredness, yeah. So sometimes we call it laziness, but I'm actually going to be, be nice with myself. I'm just going to be physically tired. Office hours, travel, work. And those are realities, right? You have to keep going. So we're not, we're not monks living in a mo uh, monastery or nuns living in a monastery where we can say, like, is, actually, is there a female form for monk? Is there? Maybe somebody can look it up. I just, sorry, random thought. I said monks and nuns. But what, what is the female equivalent of a monk? But we're not in a monk, cut off from, from the realities of life. Um, and we can do everything that we want, all of the worship that we want. Did you guys know there's a monastery? You know that road that goes along the hills from here um, through Sonol? If you go from Sonol, what's that road? Like, you turn off Sonol? Yeah, turn off Niles Canyon into Sonol Road, but it comes all the way from Sonol along these hills. I can't remember the name of that highway. There's a show like Bay Area Backroads. Anyway, they go on. The, there's a Greek Orthodox. Hmm? I think it's Calaveras, yeah. Niles Canyon, or it's off of Niles. There's a Greek Orthodox monastery out there in the hills over there. Did you guys know that? Yeah? And they, they're living over there, cut off, and they don't, they don't even prepare their own food or shop for their own food. They wait on people who are, who are also Christians from their community to bring food to them, and whatever they have, they prepare and they share amongst themselves. Um... So there are, there are still uh, uh, um, monks, uh, 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 monasteries around. And monasteries are mentioned in the Qur'an. They're mentioned in the Qur'an and saying, you know, that this is something that was, was, was brought into the faith and, and how, uh, how um, and there's a description about it. Okay, so what are some other constraints or, or stressors or distractors? Social media, yep. Yeah, what's that? The phone, yeah, that's what I put down on mine. I was like, no phone, no social, like, yeah. And WhatsApp is social media, right? We forget that. We sometimes think, oh, it's a communication tool. No, it's become social media. Um, oh, you put WhatsApp? I'm going to put WhatsApp too, yeah. WhatsApp. It is very distracting. And that archive function is really nice too. Who benefits from that? Just like, you know, there's an archive function on WhatsApp, so you can put a lot of your chats on archive, so you don't even see them as they come out. So you can just keep the ones that you want up there at the top, like family and close friends. So yeah, just archive it. And then you won't get into that thing, but I saw the blue, you know, the blue line, so I know you saw my message and you have to respond. No, I, I took off that. Oh, you can take that off? Take that off. Really? But oh, you're laughing. Because you, you knew this for a while. You can't see anyone else either. Oh, we can't. Oh, okay, but I want that app. <laughs> Give it, give it up. I'll have to give up something to get it, yeah. I gave it up once it's, 
Well, when you get attacked, in, if you ever get attacked in uh, WhatsApp, which happened to me, mm -hmm. I just, I had to do it because yeah. I don't want them to see. So I, I Oh, okay, I might. I'll, I'll, it's a discipline. Okay, blue, I'm going to put that down there. Blue. What is it called? Blue check marks. I'm going to give that up for Ramadan. See how it is. Yeah, I'll give out the blue. I'll give up the blue check marks. Um, okay, so we got the stressors and the habits. Now, looking back at your hopes. So we went through like what's. What's one hour to 35, one hour to two hours, 35 minutes? So you can kind of see, okay, what's likely on a daily basis, what's unlikely? And then you're looking at your distractors. Okay, then I have to remember the realities. So now looking at your hopes, either putting them in this, uh, this chart, just go back to them, and maybe a quick, we can do this quickly and say, what's, what's likely to happen, what's not likely to happen? And it might be everything if you look at it, right? It might be everything, but there also might be some things that are like, Okay, what are unlikely to happen? So let's just take a few minutes to put down what's likely to happen, unlikely to happen, but nice to have. And I have to, I'm going to circle nice to have. Uh, um, brother um, Shahid, where do you think I got that from? Well. I got that from him. Oh, yeah, because yeah, we've worked together on nonprofit projects now for, you know, it's been over 10 years. Yeah, over 10 years on various projects, a number of projects. And one of the things that I learned from you was that in, in planning, because usually, especially in nonprofit work, people are like, oh, let's do this, and let's do this, and let's do that, and let's do that. Every masjid has that, every school. And so he said, okay, let's separate things into, uh, what did you call them? The, it was, um, oh, this was the nice to have was when you were helping us with the Salesforce development. Okay, what are options in your, because we use Salesforce to monitor uh, or to our, our database at Tayba. We have, alhamdulillah, over 13,000 students in our database. Not all of them are active, but it's over all 50 states in over 1,000 prisons. And you can imagine we can't do that by paper and pen or even an Excel sheet. You have to use Salesforce. And so um, you helped us a lot in, 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 in bringing, in developing that more. But one of the key things was, all right, it's it would be it's uh, it's nice to have as opposed to something that's 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 unneeded. So I put unlikely to happen, but nice to have. Another thing that I learned from um, from you was um, was that when you're looking at the projects, you can have some things that are like you know like one to two days, one to two weeks, or something. You had something eight weeks or more, and then there was a term for the what was it? It was the uh, the big projects. What was it called? Oh. Epic, yeah, epic. And so just dump it into the epic uh, bucket. And do you know how many things get dumped into the epic project bucket? If you just use it in your communities or like um, um, uh, masjids or um, even homes, nice to have, but is it an epic project or is it something that we can get done in eight weeks, six weeks, four weeks, two weeks, a week? Um, so this is kind of how we're, we're thinking. So what are hopes, what are likely to happen, what's unlikely to happen, but nice to have? Okay, as you're finishing those up, um, I can see one of the things that jumped out to me is that um, I can see this is more of a, rather than just two separate charts, it's actually more of like a, like a spectrum. It should be a spectrum. And so I started putting things kind of like, oh, this is very likely to happy, happen. This is some things are actually on the border. And then there's things that are definitely unlikely. Did anybody else find that too, that it's more of like a spectrum thing? So I'm going to change this to a spectrum. Otherwise, you put everything under unlikely. Unlikely, yeah. <laughs> You don't know if you'll get completely to that goal. Like, for example, if you have a put on goal, yeah, and then being aggressive. Well, you might do some of it, but you might not get all. All of it, yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to share anything that that came out uh, came to through to them on the hopes, likely versus unlikely? Okay, now. With looking at the hopes, the likely hopes, the unlikely hopes, the reasonable limits, the constraints, the distractors that you went through, um, that daily, uh, the daily breakdown in terms of time commitments, going back, just look really quick at your, at your optimum Ramadan, the magic wand that you waved and you could have it as it is. Now go back to that first page and just take a look at that, uh, the, that drawing. Again, this is an interpretation of the hadith. We know exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did and said about that hadith. We don't know what it exactly looked like, but this is an interpretation of that. But at, in, and I, I feel it's, it's a, it's a, it's a clo very close approximation. And I've seen in other books of hadith where, where they have something similar. Sometimes the lines are diagonal. Sometimes that line in the middle actually goes through both squares. But you get the point, the, the idea. But looking at that image, 
can you now see yourself as this is yourself in your Ramadan. You can see your likely like your, your likely hopes inside the box, the unlikely hopes outside the box, and actually the line, that's a spectrum too, right? There are things that are kind of like definitely in the box, some are outside, and you see all the distractors that are there, but can you visualize those things distracting you or events that are going to come up from, from uh, on your path? Can you see that now? Okay. All right, so that was the um, first time I've ever done this in that form. Did, hopefully it was beneficial. I feel that it was, I benefited. Does it feel like it uh, benefited in preparation for Ramadan? We have about 20 more minutes, um, a half an hour before Zuhur, but I want to give time for people who want to do will do. The last page is now, now that we got an idea of what our overall Ramadan, what we would like to be, and what's likely going to, uh, what it's likely going to be, and then now what are some of the things that are going to take us off course, and how do we deal with them, now on a daily basis, one of the things that they mention in the science of the purification of the heart are to do ribat of your nefs with these six things. And what ribat is, is ribat is a fortress or maintaining a fortress. So think about a fortress out there on the frontier. It's cold, it's lonely, and you're standing there waiting for the enemy to and you're protecting your lands. And it might be weeks go by, months go by, but you have to be in a constant state of vigilance, right? You have to be physically fit. You have to be mentally sound. Oh, I sound like I'm doing the Boy Scout thing, right? Any Boy Scouts here? Are you? Do you know that one? What is it? I am going to be what? Physically? I'll be physically fit. Morally straight. Come on, I'm putting them on the spot. Okay, sometimes I, I don't even know. I'm supposed to have memorized it. One time I was at a, a scout event with my son, and afterwards somebody came up to me and said, uh, is there anything wrong Islamically with that statement? I was like, why? Why do you ask? It's like, oh, because I saw you weren't reciting it. I was like, I just haven't memorized it yet. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice, um, uh, it's a nice thing. But one of them is physically fit, morally straight, mentally sound. Is that one of them? Or no? Maybe I'm throwing that one in. I'm putting some bid'ah. And that shows you I still haven't memorized it. Um, but anyway, you have to just think about you're, you're, you're a guardian. You're at that fortress. You have to be in a constant state of readiness. Of pre you're prepared. Of vigilance. Because something could happen at any moment. And so this is the idea of ribat. And at the end of... Um, um, in the... Uh, is it the, 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 the end of Ali Imran, right? Um, that's the end of Ali Amran, right? Yeah. Those last 10 ayahs are what the Prophet ﷺ would recite every night when he would wake up and he would look at the creation and he would recite those last 10 verses. So it's, it's good to memorize those, like the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, the end of Ali Amran, um, to, and recite those at night. And since we're going to be getting up, Add, and I'm going to actually add that in there. Make sure that I read that every night. And try to look at the heavens too. So don't just recite them. Like peek out the windows and look at the heavens and then recite the end of um, uh, Ali Imran. The last 10 verses. And the last verse of that is, Oh you who believe, have patience, have musabara, which is facing your difficulties. Musabara. And have and do ribat, which is maintain this fortress, and have taqwa of Allah. Those four three things. And so the scholars have said that 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 state of murabata, of being on that fortress with yourself, are these th these six things. And they all start with meme in English m. So I call them the six m's of murabata, a model of uh, behavioral change. So the first one is musharata, which comes from the Arabic word shart. Or condition. So you're putting your goal setting. Now these are on the daily basis. So now you're going to take your, your monthly overall plan and now you're going to do this on a daily basis. The preferred time to do this is at the beginning of the day, usually after Fajr. Again, this is not, there's not a specific time to do it, but after Fajr. Since we're in the month of Ramadan and now we're forcing ourselves to get up at the end of the night, if we're not in a habit of doing Tahajjud every single night, well now we're at the, up at the time of Tahajjud because we we're going to eat and make our fast that much easier on us. So we're forcing ourselves to, to get up at that time. So after you're done eating, and before you 
while you're waiting, you know that time in between suhoor and fajr. So that's another goal. Don't eat suhoor all the way up until fajr. Because two things are going to happen. One, you're going to get into that whole debate of 18 degrees, 12 degrees, 15 degrees. You know that fit debate of when does fajr come in? It's better to, what I advise people is stop eating at the early time and pray after the later time. And then that'll give you about a good 15 or 20 minutes so that you can do the sunnahs where the Prophet ﷺ would wait in between eating and fajr. And you can do things like this. You can pull out your, your log and say, okay, today what am I going to do? I have my monthly goal, but today what is my monthly goal? And when you're setting those goals, there's four areas that you're thinking of. Staying away from the haram and the makruh, the prohibited and the disliked. Though both of those things, not just the haram, we're staying away from the prohibited and the disliked things. And we're performing the fard and we're performing the sunnah. We're perfor performing obligatory things and sunnah. So those are the four that we look at. Of the five rulings of Islam, because everything falls into five rulings, it's either fard, sunnah, makru, haram, or what? Mubah, permissible. But you, you see that it's not in there. Because for the person who's being serious about their faith, you're staying away from even the permissible things. But how are you staying away from the permissible things? Through intention. So instead of just drinking a glass of water, you make the, the intention, I'm doing this to keep my body healthy and alive. Bismillah. Now you get the reward of a fard. When you stay away from the haram, you even though uh, you, you stay away from the haram with an intention, uh, when you go to sleep, you make the intention, I'm going to sleep because my body needs it. And especially in Ramadan, you need to say like, okay, I need to do all of these things, but I need to take a nap. I might need to take a nap or I need to get some sleep because you could, like you said, Layla, you could, you could pursue things aggressively, right? Because everybody knows what happens. You guys call it post-call, um, post right? In the medical field, post-call. What about post-qiyam? What does your post-qiyam day look like? We know what the post-qiyam day looks like because you're just, your body needs to recharge. It's like, okay, you're not, go you're not going to give me sleep. I'm going to take it from you. Um, and so you keep that in mind, like, oh, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to give my body sleep, I'm going to give it food, I'm going to give it water, I'm going to give it uh, a, a break, even from worship, because I don't have to constantly be in a state of worship. I'm going to do some, maybe some, some permissible uh, something just to kind of like give me, um, uh, uh, relax, like um, some self-care. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was a, a young sahaba, and he, a sahabi companion, and he, a scholar even from a young age, and he was called by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hibr, the scholar of this ummah, in his, in his majalis, in his gatherings of ilm, every once in a while he would stop, and he would say, bring the poetry. Let's just recite some poetry. Just kind of like, now let's, let, let's take a break. So you do have to put that in there too. Like, how are we going to take a break? But you're staying away from the haram, the makru, performing the fard and the sunnah. Really quickly, you know, when you think about your, your optimum Ramadan, we, we also have to look at, did I, did I include all four of those things in there? Because usually when we think about prepare for Ramadan, we're just thinking about the worship and the ibadah and the, the fard and the sunnah of it. But are we including the other things as well? Staying away from the haram, staying away from things that are makru, uh, working on relationships with, 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 with people, bettering our relationships with people. So we set the goals at the beginning of the day, then there's mujahada. Mujahada is that you're exerting your strength, you're working your best, and you're, you're making sure like, okay, I'm gonna start my day and I'm gonna do my best. And so like the story that you, that you mentioned um, uh, earlier, the, 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 the person who got to 10 a.m. with a full fast, and then somebody to dhuhr with a full fast. And we know that. We know when we're at our best, and we know when we fall short, but we just constantly, we're, we're, we're trying to exert ourselves, to do mujahada, uh, which comes from the word jihad, um, which not all jihad is military, right? Hey, guys, I know the Internet's out there. Memory.org, pick it up. You guys know memory? I'm going to ask Manir to cut that out. I don't want to give them free, free advertising. Um, so, uh, mujahada is, um, um, is exerting your strength. And then muraqaba is self-monitoring. You're watching yourself. You're watching yourself as you go through the things. And so you're monitoring yourself. Now, on this one, this one is very key because our, our nefs, our self, inclines towards monitoring other people. We love monitoring other people. You know how that saying is, if you point one finger at another person, right? How many are pointing back at you? 
four. They say four, right? But it's like actually two people, two or depends on how you point, but it's usually three are pointing. But that's it's symbolic of what we do as human beings. We're naturally inclined to notice the faults of other people and to not notice our own faults. And we're even reminded to this in the way Allah has created our physiological responses to things. There's things about ourselves that we're okay. Like if you pick up a cup and you drink from it and some of your saliva gets on the cup, you're like, oh, no big deal, right? But if it's somebody else's saliva, automatically, ew, right? So even at a physiological level, we're created to be more disgusted by the faults or by the attributes of other people than we are of our own attributes. Part of that, I think, is also a... Um, it's just a protective factor, right? People in the medical community would know that because if you have, if you have some disease that you want to prevent the spread of disease, well, then some of those things you don't, you want to have that. So that's like a protective factor. But there's a lesson that we can learn as well that we're we're more inclined to forgive ourselves before we forgive others, to notice the faults of others. So it is a shift. We have to shift shift to say, okay, I want to monitor myself more than the faults of others. It doesn't mean that we don't notice because we have to, we live in a world where there's other people, people do things, they make mistakes, they harm us, we might harm them. So we do have to have some monitoring of the world around us, but we want to make our strength, our self-monitoring, muraqaba. What did you do? What did you think? When that person said that, what were you thinking about? And then to also have a, um, a, self, a, a self that's critical of, your, uh, of yourself. So Allah swears in the Quran by three nafs. There's three souls that Allah swears by. He swears by the souls, the human souls. Three of them. One of them is what? A maratun bisut. He, by, or, or sorry, I just should say swear by. But he mentions in the Quran three souls. One of them is an a maratun bisut. That that the 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 soul that is inclined towards evil, that is pushing towards evil. What is the other type of soul? Hmm? Lawama, the self-critical soul. And then the third one? Hmm? Mulhima. Yeah, there is the, the mulhima yeah, as well. But, but you like in the word in the Quran. Mutma'inna, yeah. Um, because there is the ilham and so there are uh, Thank you for mentioning that. So there is, there also some people say there's actually six types that are mentioned in the Quran. But three that are, uh, are, are literally mentioned is the amaratun bisu, the, cell, the soul that is um, inclined towards evil. Um, the lawama, the self-critical, and then the mutma'inna, uh, the, the soul at, at, at tranquil. Um, and so, but which one of those does Allah swear by? Hmm? Fala uqsimu lawama. He swears by the self-critical soul. So think about that. We've all been in that situation. Why'd you do that? You're talking to yourself. Why'd you do that? I shouldn't have done that. That's not what a good Muslim does. That soul that allows you to have that self-critical application against yourself, Allah is swearing by that soul. So, you know, give yourself a pat on the back. Alhamdulillah, it's better than being a, 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 a maratun basu. The other thing to remember about those, the, the, at least those three, and, and Jazakallah khair, Brother Sahir, there are others that are, that are implied as well and, and mentioned in some of the books. Um, the, the, the nefs... Um, what was I going to say? SubhanAllah. Last, um, okay. The muraqaba, the, self, the, the, the critical soul. Oh, this is what it was. That some people think that those are actually three separate stages of your development. Like you, start, you can have like a, you're, you're at a amara, you're just a bad soul. And then you're a self-critical soul and then you're a mutma'inna soul. And it's not that. Your soul could actually go through all three elements of those in a single day, in a single hour, or even in a single moment. You can have an element of your soul that's mutma'inna, and an element that's uh, amaratun basu, and an element that's, that's uh, lawama, self-critical. Think about this. For people who maybe did not pray five times a day, it was difficult. And then you had to exert some effort, and then it became normal. So you went through in the prayer those three stages. But then even the presence of prayer, maybe you're distracted. And then you start working on not getting distracted, and then it becomes natural. And then your level of focus on the prayer grows. And so you can constantly be going through those three stages, even in just one aspect of worship. Or let me give you another example as well. Do you know people who do not pray, do not fast, but they will never tell a lie? Some people who might not even uh, pray, 
But in business dealings, they are honest as, you know, to no end. And then there are people who pray five times a day and at the first line of the prayer and they're up at Tehejud, but you don't want to have any money around that person. Is that an exaggeration? There are people like that, right? So when it comes to the prayer, that person might have itminan, that, that, that um, tranquil soul, and so their soul is not repelling them from performing the prayer. But when money comes up, all of a sudden, they're nafsa amarat and besu. Oh, let me see how I can get one over on this person. I can come up. Let me get some money. So it can be all at those, uh, at those levels. You want to be um, monitoring yourself. Um, and then at the end of the day, you do what's called a muhasaba, a self-evaluation. Now you look at yourself. So you can have a journal, a 30-day journal. It doesn't have to be a template. And start out at the beginning of every day. Set your goals. Throughout the day, you're, 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 you're striving. Also throughout the day, you're, 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 you're monitoring yourself. You're policing yourself. And then at the end of the day, you do a muhasaba. And so usually this, you can do this after asr. After asr is a good time too, or maybe even after, you know, in the evening in Ramadan. Wherever you can find, you can break away and find five to ten minutes just to evaluate yourself on that day. How did I do? And give yourself, you could even do a, a grading uh, a score. One to three, one to five, one to ten on each of those items. How, did, how well did I do on this? How well did I do? And then after you self-evaluate, you do the muhasaba. Um, and this also comes from a hadith. Um, take yourselves to account before you're taking to account. Hasibu uh, anfusakum. Like take yourselves to account. And then once you got that, then there's a mu'aqaba and the mu'ataba. The mu'aqaba is where you give yourself a consequence. And the mu'ataba is where you self-reprimand. The, the mu'aqaba, though, it has, to be, it has to be mentioned that it can only be something that sh that's, that's in line with, uh, with, with the Islamic law, with, the, with sharia. You can't do something, you know, you can't punish yourself with something uh, that would be haram. So you would do something like Imam al-Ghazali mentions, if you, if you did a sin with your eyes, well, then take your eyes away from something that it likes to look at. So if there was something you like to watch, you can't watch that anymore. No privileges for you. You lose your privileges, but you're doing this to yourself. Or somebody ate something haram, and so the, the, um, the, the consequence would be you're not going to get that treat. You have to almost treat yourself like a, like a parent would to their child. Or maybe you do something haram, and yeah, you don't get that cup of coffee. You know, if you really like coffee, like I do, right? Punish yourself with, you're going to skip coffee. You get a consequence, your decision. So you do a consequence, and every, again, everybody knows what, like, uh, actually I was uh, speaking with one of my students who was in prison, and he said, what did he do? Oh, he really liked a TV show, but then he had given himself a goal, and he fell short on that goal, and he said, well, you're not watching that show tonight. And he said, actually, you're not watching that show until you get that as a habit. And guess what happened? He, he said he got it as a habit really quickly. But he did it to himself. And, and you have to stick to that, to, to, the, um, uh, to the limits. And then the mu'ataba is the self-reprimand, where you just, you reprimand yourself for that, for that action. So these are the six M's of, uh, of murabata. Uh, like Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud says in the Matarat al-Qulub, murabata al-nafsa bisittin. Do rubat of your nafs with, with these six things. I want to leave the last uh, five, ten minutes uh, for any questions. Um, glad I was able to get through everything. Hopefully this is something that can help us um, have a better Ramadan and make our Ramadan better than any previous Ramadan. Um, and uh, I know it's going to, it's given me, it's taken something that's like, I generally keep things like out in, okay, I want to do this, I want to do this, but now it's down on paper. Makes it a little bit easier to, um, um, to, to, to handle. Uh, along with any questions, if you don't mind mentioning maybe something, or if you could email this, like my email is not up there, but just Rami, R A M I, at tabafoundation.org, if you don't mind doing this, um, if you could email any, any ideas that you have of how we could develop this further. So if there's anything that you see that we could develop this, you know, do, and something comes to mind, or maybe it's not now. Maybe after Ramadan you try this and you say, oh, you know what, I think uh, um, we could add this or add uh, that. This is, a, this is a work in progress, and I want uh, feedback from how, how it lands and, and how we could develop it. So any questions before we end? In the back? Okay. 
Um, so the question was, excellent question. Uh, what's the difference between mu'aqaba and mu'ataba? Um, so the mu'aqaba, because they are related. Like if you get, you know, if you get, um, if you get chewed out by your teacher, or you get held back into re um, uh, from recess, those are both consequences, right? But the mu'aqaba the, the mu is something that you do to yourself, or could even be leaving, like it's an actual, like a punishment, like in that one case, the person skipped the TV show that he, that he liked watching. So that's, that's, your, that's your consequence. The mu'ataba is something you're telling yourself. You know, you look in the mirror and say, well, why'd you do that? Or you're just talking to yourself. It's the, the self-talk, so maybe that, that's one of the things. It's self-talk. Where you're, 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 it's a, it's just a, it's a, uh, it's a verbal or it could be a mental reprimand to yourself, a mu'ataba, as opposed to the mu'aqaba, which is something like a consequence. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well, what would you say? Because I, I was thinking about that. We need, to, uh, we don't have that much time. But what would you say? What's like a quick advice to 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 distinguish between the, the especially since you're a professional in the mental health field. <laughs> So the question is how, so on the self-talk, the self-reprimand, because if you say like, okay, you, you, you messed up on something, you did something that you shouldn't have done, or you didn't do something that you should have done, right? You messed up. And now you're going to be self-critical of yourself. The fear is that if you're too self-critical of yourself, you could actually go in a di downward spiral. You could like, isn't, is that, that's correct? Like you could even, yeah. some people can actually get into a state of depression if they have too much self-critical talk. And so the question that Summer asked was, how do you, how do you balance between having that self-talk be positive as opposed to the self-talk or that self-reprimand be something that could be negative? And so I asked her what her advice was, and she said, so one of the things that, that they do in, the, in, in therapy is ask the person, if they're having these self-critical thoughts, check the facts. What's a fact versus not a fact? What's some of the evidence behind it? Um, and then what are some of the causes of having that thought and what's so what's causing this thought and how can you use this thought to to, to make a change for something better right yeah it's kind of like when we do like check the facts it's like okay let me think about it is this actually true and if it is true then like what are the things that you can do to change it mm. and if it's not true then why are you having oh okay so if it if it is true let me just write that down so yeah you do check the facts and so if it, if it, if it's if it's not true, then what do you do? If it's not true, then you're kind of like. Um, where does it come from? Noticing where it's coming from. Okay, where it's coming from. And if it is true, then like, what can you do to? Because there's something clearly that you're not happy, like you're doing that you're not happy. So what can you do to change it? Okay. It's kind of more like action based. Yeah, so it's action based. Mm -hmm. Okay, did everybody hear that? So you'd like check the facts. If it's not true, where is it coming from? And if it is true, what can you do to change it? Um, one thing that comes to my mind too, even when we say not true, is some things you, when you're examining the evidence, you say, okay, w at what level? So say, for example, somebody put a goal that, okay, I'm going to do this many rak'ahs of tarawih or this many pages of the Quran, and then they don't do it at the end of the day. And now they're like, they're, they're going to start self-reprimanding themselves, and they're like, you're lazy. Okay, that's now a general thing. You're lazy. You're just a lazy believer. You're a lazy Muslim. You could do better. One thing that comes to mind is that one of uh, the, the students asked our teacher, Murabat al-Hajj, he said, how can I be a person who's not lazy? I don't want to be a lazy Muslim. He said, perform the fard and you're not lazy. Do the fard and you are not a lazy Muslim. Now that reframes everything, right? Because we set the bar, if we put the bar really high and we don't hit it, we're like, oh, we're a lazy Muslim. But he's saying, look, the bare minimum, it gets you out of that thing, uh, you know, that level of, uh, of being a, a, a lazy person or kesal, as it's uh, mentioned. Um, so when we, when we check the facts, we actually have to also examine that evidence. Like you said, where is it coming from? And am I even being, am I being fair with myself? So that self-critical, so that's an area where you can develop somewhere. Take this. Mu'ataba, mu'ataba, and run with it. Like develop a model of healthy mu'ataba for the Muslim. Mashallah. Mm, so, um, you, so you said that that, um, um, that when you when you when you notice the, that self reprimand, that you you try to distinguish what's what's actually true and what might be trickery of the shaitan, because he is he's he's a deceiver and he will he will get there in very very. Um, deceptful um, uh, ways so uh, and if it and if it is from the the trickery of the shaitan uh, you ignore it but you are also at the same time you have shukr thankfulness that you were able to go through that process any other questions or 
Okay, Jazakum Allah khair, I hear the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Um, and we'll end right there. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.